Hi everybody, time for our next chapter and this is called A Touch of Oliver. My grandmother was a formidable old lady. She was six feet tall and dressed in flowing black with a crochet shawl around her shoulders. She carried herself with grace and dignity. In later years she used a walking stick but she walked with regal bearing until the day she died at 98 years of age. It could be that she needed the stick to maintain law and order when she was unable to move as fast as she wanted. For while grandmothers are supposed to be loving and soft-bosomed, mine certainly did not fit into that picture. She was strong-willed and domineering and ruled the house with a rod of iron. Her husband was dead with years, so she ran the large farm herself and thrived on it. She was a forerunner of the struggle for equality, and she was confident that most women could run a business as well, if not better, than men. She did just that but in her time she was no ordinary woman. She killed her own pig and seldom sent for a vet as she could dose cattle and repair fractures like an expert. Some of her mother's people were doctors, so she maintained that medicine was in her blood and, indeed, when one of her workmen was gored by a bull, her fast, skilful action saved his life. Though in some ways she was ahead of her time, in others she belonged to the era of the French Revolution. When our revolution came and the black and tans rampaged around the country, my grandmother, a staunch Republican, was in the thick of it. Anyone on the run knew that they could get a safe harbouring in her house. The black and tans knew this as well and many nights when the family were fast asleep the lorries drove into the yard, loud banging started on the door and the house was searched. One night a young man called Larry who was on the run was asleep upstairs in the same room as her young son. Her two daughters were in another room. Suddenly the loud knocking started and she woke up. Realising that they had not heard the warning noise of the lorries, she got out of bed slowly, hoping to give Larry time to get away, but she did not know that the house was surrounded. She still delayed in answering, and the knocking turned to banging, demanding that she open in the name of the king. Eventually, she opened the door and the soldiers trooped in past her. They searched the house thoroughly, even turning the bedclothes out on the floor, but finding nothing, they became very annoyed, because they seemed certain that there should have been somebody there. My grandmother was a tough woman who did not know the meaning of fear. She asked them to leave now that they had searched her house. She refused to get drawn into an argument with them but stayed tight-lipped, which could not have been easy for her as silence was not one of her virtues. The officer in charge, who had called many times, looked at my grandmother and remarked, You remind me of my mother. Well, indeed, she snapped back, your mother must not be up to much to raise a blackguard like you. At last they left warning her that they'd be calling again and that she'd be caught eventually. She went to the door and listened to the lorries, listened to hear the lorries starting up in the lane. Then she put her children back to bed and sat by the fire for a long time. Opening the front door, she checked in the half-light of the dawn to make sure that there was nobody about. It had happened before that the tans had doubled back, hoping to catch them unprepared. Eventually, when she was convinced that they were safe, she stood in the middle of the kitchen and called out, In the name of God, where are you? Beside the fire in the kitchen was an old settle bed, which appeared to be a timber seat when it was closed up. The tans had checked it, but when the cover did not rise, they had assumed that it was just a seat. Out of this, with his face white as a sheet, rolled Larry. It had been a narrow escape. She was convinced that the tans had known that somebody was there that night, so they must have been tipped off. She suspected a family further back the valley, and she never forgave them. If ever their name came up in conversation, her face would darken and she'd say, Bad blood there. When I was young, I never stayed at her house as I was half afraid of her, though gradually, as she got older, she grew a little bit more mellow, or else I got braver with the years. Working for her in the house was a saintly girl called Mary, who often stood between me and my grandmother's wrath. Once, my grandmother had boiled a chicken, and she loved the chicken broth which she had cooling in a jug on a table at the bottom of the kitchen. I decided to do a big clean-up, and finding this jug full of water, as I thought, I threw it out the door. When she discovered what I had done, I had to spend the rest of the day out on the farm with my uncle. As my grandmother grew older, she spent more time sitting on a chair beside the fire, from where she talked non-stop. Later, I regret regretted that I had not paid more attention to her, as she had a tremendous memory and a great mind, with crystal clear thinking to the very end. She was a constant reader of the Irish press, which my uncle brought to her every day when he went to the creamery. When he came in the door, she'd say, Give me that paper till I see what old Brookbro is saying today. All her life she took a keen interest in politics and was a fanatical supporter of de Valera. As my father was on the other side of the coin, she was always slightly suspicious of him. However, politics apart, they had great respect for one another. My grandmother had one strange chink in her armour. Every couple of years, 
she took to her bed and decided she was going to die. Admittedly, this idiosyncrasy did not begin until she was over 70, so on the law of averages she could have been right. But she was no average woman, and when the local doctor came he always annoyed her intensely by telling her that she was fine and had years to live. She got over this problem by contacting one of her own relations, who was a doctor in the next parish. He understood what was expected of him and prescribed tablets and told her that yes, she was quite ill and should stay in bed. My uncle regarded all this with great amusement and referred to these outbreaks as a touch of Oliver. Why he called it this, I do not know, but when he came to our house and said that herself is a touch of Oliver, we all knew what he meant. But perhaps the doctor understood more than he got credit for. This strong woman, who never showed any softness, needed to go to bed and be comforted occasionally, and after a few days she'd be back on her feet again. When she'd come to live on the home farm after getting married, her mother-in-law, father-in-law and a brother of her husband's were already in the house before her. The brother-in-law got married and had two children before leaving to set up in business. Despite this extended family living together under one roof, complete harmony prevailed, and all attributed this fact to my grandmother. She was a woman of many parts. She had a constant flow of visitors, including one old friend who always brought her a present of a bottle of whiskey, which he drank before he went home. <coughs> Excuse me. She was very lucky in the fact that when my uncle married, she got a splendid daughter-in-law. I was there the first morning she took over the kitchen, and I was open-mouthed in astonishment at her efficiency. Grandmother had great admiration for capable people, so if the daughter-in-law had been lacking in ability, it could have caused a problem. My uncle was a happy, big-hearted man who lived very comfortably between his two remarkable women. He was a sociable person who visited us regularly and always loved to have us call when we were home on holidays. In later years, when television came and he had acquired a set, he put it in a cupboard. When the television was on, naturally the cupboard was opened, but as soon as anybody came in visiting, he turned it off and shut the cupboard. He maintained that television should be kept in its place and never take precedence over people. When my grandmother died, it might have been expected that some of her old pictures might be taken down off the walls. However, when I called some years afterwards, I was surprised and delighted to see the same old grand aunts and uncles still smiling down at me. Her daughter-in-law remembered the old lady with love and affection. As my grandmother was such an overwhelming personality, there was a danger that she might have overshadowed her only son. But this, however, was not the case because, while she was forthright and domineering, he sailed through life on a sunshine cloud. They were two very different types of people. My uncle believed that life was for playing hard and working hard, and he never did anything by half measure. Sitting at the top of the kitchen table, he would bang it with his fist and sing, I'm sailing along on a trolley. I feel like a big millionaire. And indeed, he was very generous. When we stayed with my grandmother, he never came from town without something in his pockets for us. He put me on a pony for my first time, gave the pony a slap on the rump and set her galloping across the field with me clinging on for dear life. Finally, all the tackling which was on the pony, she had just come from the creamery, slid off and I came with it. I kicked him hard in the shins in retaliation, but he only laughed and said, Get up now again. In a temper, I did just that, but became so thrilled by this new experience that I rode the pony barebacked all day and could not sit down for a week afterwards. One winter, we had very heavy snow, which stayed on the ground for almost two months. There were drifts over six feet high along the fields, and, as if this was not bad enough, a very severe flu came at the same time. When some of our family caught it, we found it difficult to try to keep the cattle fed, but my uncle arrived on horseback every day and stayed until all the work was done, even though he had to go home then and see to his own animals as well. He had a great sense of family loyalty and togetherness. That's all that counts at the end of the day, he told me once. On the morning of his wedding, we were walking down the passage from the house on the way to the church. Suddenly, he shot in a gap and fled across the field. When I caught up with him, I asked what was all this about. Very unlucky, Alice, to meet a foxy woman the morning you're getting married and Kate was coming round the next corner. Kate was a red-haired woman of the roads whom we met every day, but my uncle was taking no chances this morning. The only time I ever saw him sad was the day that Connie was buried. He sat in our kitchen, pale-faced and silent, one of the images that impressed on my child's mind that this was a terrible day. I suppose that small children, to whom death is incomprehensible, can only judge its seriousness by the reaction of familiar adults. I decided that anything that could wipe the smile off my uncle's face must be disastrous. In his autumn years, my uncle developed terminal cancer. I visited him in a hospital after his operation and was shattered by what illness can do to a great-hearted man. His wife nursed him in his last months, and it was awe-inspiring to see the dedication and care which true love can create. Slaw 